KQED in San Francisco, this is the Writer's Block. My name is Masha Tupitsen, and I'm the author of Beauty Talk and Monsters, a collection of film-based stories published by Simeotext. A fusion of real and imagined Hollywood, Beauty Talk and Monsters is told through the movies and explores a lineage of familiar myths and on and off-screen cinematic excess. I will be reading from the first section of the second story in the book called Kleptomania. This section is called Judy and fuses three intergenerational female movie icons and characters, allowing them to meet up for a day over cocktails at a bar. Marnie, Judy, and Diane all walked out of the building together, not arm in arm, but close and somewhere along those historical lines. They were in the same boat, a ferry more or less, and I felt seasick just looking at them. I don't know if they were all employed at the time they walked out or just having separate meetings at the same time and place, but actors stay in the picture even when they're not in the picture, like memories. It was a Tuesday morning, a November, everything was transparent. Wind was blowing, parted a curtain, and I saw in, I saw them. Architects were starting to use glass lingerie frivolously all over the city, and I could shamelessly see through everything those women the way that Superman can see through women's clothes. The doors, the lobbies, the elevators, the ceilings were all lacy bras. The windows were spreading out into full clarity, full likeness, and, I, and no one could look at each other with so much sun in their eyes. I felt paranoid and hypersensitive open the way that only paranoia can open things. Everything felt politically tied and doomed like in the movie The Parallax View. I wore sunglasses so that I could have some privacy with my vista or some relief from it. I didn't want anyone to recognize my mood, which was all an act anyway. I could see the three women riding down the escalator together as if I'd planned it, except they weren't looking at each other or me the way I'd be looking at each of them if it were a movie and not just something I happened to see on my way home from the park. In New York City, you can watch movies being made all the time. They shut down traffic the way I can never shut anything down. When I saw that Marnie, Judy, and Diane weren't looking at each other, I wasn't the least bit surprised, since women usually only look at other women if they think one of those women has something they might want. Envy has always been in the picture, even before the picture. Descriptions of other people and word of mouth spread it around like water levels that rise up from too much rain and move onto the street. They were all sort of in the same frame. Diane was probably there that day having coffee and self-consciously laughing her way through the Godfather script with some producers in a glass room on the 17th floor. She was being panoramic in her outlook, thinking about the future, thinking ahead. They talked about when the film crew planned to go to Italy to shoot Michael's wedding while he left Diane behind to marry someone else, someone easier to deal with. They talked about Diane's shooting schedule and what she would need to wear to get, in, to get into character for the period, the whole nine yards. It was like Diane was really married and not just acting it. This bought her some time in her personal life. You're good, they told Diane, but you could stand to lose some weight and look a little sadder. Thin people are always more permeable, you know. Their motor never goes off. But then you'll need to cheer up, they said. You'll need to look happy again. In the first Godfather, you'll be trapped inside, indoors all day, and in the sequel prequel, no one will let you come anywhere near the property. Diane was an actor, after all. She could look like and say a lot of things she didn't mean. Eight years before Marnie had been Marnie, Judy was already dead. More than 21,000 people lined the streets to view the open casket. Judy wore the silver lamé gown that she wore at her most recent wedding. The casket was white metal and lined with blue velvet with a sneeze guard for her protection. James Mason delivered her eulogy. They wanted someone with a unique voice to match Judy's, plus he'd been her right-hand man in A Star is Born, and rumor goes committed suicide too. Judy's mourners included her daughters Liza Minnelli and Lorna Luft, her son Joey Luft, her ex-husband Sid Luft, June Allison, Lauren Bacall, Jack Benny, Sammy Davis Jr., Cary Grant, Katherine Hepburn, Burt Lancaster, Dean Martin, Mickey Rooney, Frank Sinatra, and Lana Turner. I wonder if any of these people actually gave a shit, or if it was just another Hollywood party. They'd had the funeral televised and everything overseas. It was the swinging 60s, and Judy finally died in a way everyone could relate to. Sleep. It was hip to pass out. 
Cats did it, jazz musicians, rock stars, drug addicts, Marilyn Monroe, and kids who like to stay up all night. Everyone who was young wasn't home or awake to watch Judy's coffin get carried in and out of buildings on TV so early in the morning. At night, all the teenagers were out, leaning lazily on buildings like graffiti with one leg up, a bunch of John Voids and Midnight Cowboy trying not to seem too naive or rural. And maybe they heard someone say, word on the street is Judy's dead. Everyone pretended to be clean and blank, chalkboards with only the faintest haze of script. Judy must have been alive that day, or she was up the way songs stay alive and float around in people's heads and mouths, or just in the air sometimes, like a ghost or a soundtrack. Maybe it just sounded like Judy was there. That was her thing, being a sound, a song and dance. Or maybe Diane felt so angry after her meeting, she was humming one of Judy's tunes to herself, Is That All There Is? And like the saying goes, seeing red all over the place, the way Marnie did before she was cured. Judy sang through the space between the two women, erratic like a bluebird hitting the windshield of a car. What if Diane and Marnie decided to go out and get a drink together? I wonder if it would have helped ease the tension of acting all the time, the generational fibers hooking up and linking, a dream where anyone can be with anyone in any form regardless of the date and time. In a dream I once opened up a chapter that needed it and made love to every detail rolled into one like a checklist. Everything I'd ever wanted or thought about was there. I was an envelope of mixed up love letters opened and sloshing around in a bag of past. I was on some amorous planet, maybe Venus, but more varied, in the blanket of a barn where the hay was silk and pillows, and this everything plugged into me as though I was an ancient electric socket. A giant movie screen at a 1950s drive-in, which I am anyway. And then I lit up like a sentimental atomic bomb, the one in Dr. Strangelove, and the whole world tuned in and got scared. But I wasn't poison. I didn't have an orgasm. The whole thing was one, not just the end. It was still early, and maybe no one would see Marnie, Diane, and Judy or bother them, and the bar would be empty and warm only a few blocks away. They could take their coats off, except Diane. She likes to keep everything cinched, even if it's unseasonal. Maybe the bartender would see the three women, get excited but not excited enough to scare them away, and slide open the bar just for them. It would be like a movie scene in a bar. Where's Hitch, he'd ask Marnie as a joke, slapping his knee hard with a bar rag. I wonder if Marnie would tell him, the way most people do when they get around bars and bartenders, that her and Hitch had stopped talking because Hitch couldn't tell the difference between what he wanted to see on screen and what she was in real life. Marnie got caught up in the curtain, but maybe Marnie, like Marnie in the movie, kept stuff like that stuff to herself, like Norman Bates's taxidermied animals in Psycho, seeing colors instead of feeling emotions. I like that Ingrid Bergman doesn't do that in Notorious, said Marnie on the way there. She's so in touch with her feelings. Diane wasn't like Marnie either. She was more upfront about things that bothered her, or at least she was in training to be that way. Diane had a psychoanalyst who told her not to star as Joanna Eberhardt in The Stepford Wives because the movie gave him bad vibes. I guess he got good ones off of Woody Allen. Plus, Diane was independent. She said she didn't plan on having any children, at least biologically. She was different in a jokey, androgynous kind of way. She wore pants and ties and masculine hats just like a man, but she was all over the place and neurotic and self-deprecating, pulled by a thread just like a woman. She was what Woody Allen wanted, just like Marnie was what Hitchcock wanted. Except Diane accepted Woody's come-ons, and Marnie rejected Hitchcock's. Diane didn't attract too much attention walking to the bar with Marnie, because Diane's days on the screen were all in the future, and Marnie's were all in the past. Combined, it was like neither of them existed. They canceled each other out. This is before Annie Hall and looking for Mr. Goodbar, so really, no one was expecting Diane to show up anywhere in her boyish Ralph Lauren, tweed jacket, tie, vest, hat, suspenders, tennis racket. No one thinks that kind of gender bending is cool unless it shows up on the cool screen or on a cool someone else. Maybe the confusing clothes come after the movies and not before. Once people know you, you can get away with more and less. It's amazing that Diane was able to get her own style into the picture. And when it comes to famous people, that kind of shit doesn't fly anymore. 
Everyone's got a stylist now, a clothing publicist. In interviews these days, Diane talks about that a lot, looking back on the good old days. Now she says in so many words, no one will let anyone get anywhere near anything that spells personal or independent. I'm unique, she says, but doesn't say. That day in the bar, Diane was close to her film interiors, which she would make seven years down the line, a prophetic number, a number that gets shit done. In interiors, she stuck with a bearded rapist for her husband, who writes poetry only not as well as she does, a subject of dispute throughout the film the way it wouldn't be if the more talented one was the husband. The husband tries to get back at Diane by trying to rape her talentless sister in a garage. In the movie, Diane is pensive, curly-haired, the result of a bad perm, dressed in sepia tones the color of dried menstrual blood, or amenorrhea, no blood at all. Her genius supposedly makes her unfeminine, unfeeling, depleted in other ways, though since she does have actual children, the barrenness is more associative and metaphoric. It's how she makes other people around her feel. I don't know how she's able to write brilliant poetry if she can't feel anything, but that's how Woody Allen is, full of secret assaults. For example, it's no fun to fuck a woman who won't let you be all Woody all the time. Through the looking glass door in the Hamptons, Diane peers at the cobalt ocean, waiting for her crazy mother to drown, no sun to blind her. At the bar, Marnie and Diane drank what Judy drank and drank a lot of it. And when she was old enough, Melanie followed in their footsteps and later went on to mix it with bigger and more immediate things on the set of Working Girl or whenever she was with Don Johnson. There are things that go on forever, like an inherited technique for swallowing problems. At the table where they sat in the back by a real fire, Judy picked up on Diane's weariness and told her and Marnie that whenever she was asked to starve for a new movie, which was all the time for weeks at a time, MGM would only let her eat chicken bouillon and downers, and then they'd give her uppers so that she could work through the night and through the depletion. There's even a picture of me at an award ceremony, she said, eating soup, just soup and water. Over the years, people will become familiar with that picture and they'll talk about it. They'll make sad documentaries about it. She asked Marnie and Diane if they'd seen it. Marnie said, of course. I'm in black and white at a banquet table sitting all by myself. I'm in a white gown that barely fits and boy do I look terrible with all those pounds on girls, but I'm inches away from shedding all of them like a bloated snake. I struggled to keep it off until the day I died. I was a rake the last years of my life. While everyone else is having fun and drinking, walking back and forth, collecting their awards, Judy is starving and eating soup all by herself like she's got the flu. Only instead of looking healthy and refreshed the way people who eat strawberries and drink celery juice all day at health spas do, Judy looks tired and worn out and white like a kabuki performer, only without the bright streaks of color on the eyes and lips. Her face is a trick mask for someone who wants to look old but isn't, like Marnie's mother and Marnie. And I think it's impossible for someone to look old so young. Looking at the three of them, I think problems get passed down like houses and photographs. Jesus, Judy, said Diane, a very different kind of woman from Judy, I guess. It really sounds like they were trying to kill you. They were, said Judy. They did. To subscribe to the Writer's Block and hear more stories, please visit www.kqed.org slash writersblock. The Writer's Block is produced by KQED.